comment toll free at 1-888-922-2149 or locally at 215-949-3232. And that's the bottom line because the loose cannon said so. All right, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Argiulo and this a very special edition of Pro Wrestling Radio. And over the last seven days, Monday specifically, this great sport lost one of our greats, a true pioneer and innovator of this business in Mr. Perfect, Kurt Henning. And Kurt Henning is the kind of a guy that completely revolutionized this sport as to the way that you see it presented to you today in a more athletically based form. Kurt Henning came along, especially to the WWE, at a time when stars like Tugboat, Hulk Hogan, The Ultimate Warrior, Earthquake, guys that were big, not very mobile, but more entertaining. And Kurt Henning came along and put the sport back in sports entertainment. And uh, this is the first time, to my knowledge anyway, that I've had a, a member of this family, the, the pro wrestling radio family. I've had a memory, excuse me, a, a family member lost. And I consider him a family member because he was a past guest on the program. I consider everybody that calls into the show, whether you've called him once or a million times, a family member of this program. And I thought about it over the last few days as to how... I could come on here and eulogize this man because I have always been a big, big fan of his. I mean, going back to his matches in Memphis, going back to that 60-minute that draw that he had with Nick Bockwinkle from Las Vegas on ESPN years ago, the bloodbath, going back to the series of matches that he had with Bret Hart, that he had with Shawn Michaels, that he had with Ric Flair. The man just truly epitomized everything that an athlete should be in professional wrestling. And in thinking about it, I went back and screened the interview that I had played with Kurt Henning back in November of the year 2000, November 22nd, the year 2000. And it just expressed so much that the, the kind of a man he is, the kind of passion that he had for this business. When you listen to this interview that I will replay momentarily, you can tell that as he's doing the interview, he has a smile on his face. And while I've had a lot of great guests over the years, from Bret Hart to, to Shane Douglas to Dusty Rhodes to Ricky Steen, but a lot of legends, it's very rare that when you get them on the air, they, they, they do it with, with, with such a smile on their face. And you could tell that he just loved talking about wrestling. He just loved talking about the business. He's a second-generation wrestler. His father, Larry the Axe Henning, um, you know, one of, the, one of the true legends of this sport. And I had Kurt on this program November the 22nd of 2000 to promote an upcoming match that was taped that was to air on pay-per-view from Australia with Dennis Rodman. And in that time, we talked about a variety of different subjects. Remember, this is prior to his return to the WWE in the 2002 Royal Rumble, as well as this is past his tenure in World Championship Wrestling. And it's, it's, it's sadly ironic because I was planning on having Kurt back on the program in a few weeks. I'd stayed in touch with him after the interview, and he was just a good man. He was just a good guy. You know, there's a lot of people that I have had the opportunity to meet in this business over the years, and some of them are jerks, and some of them are, are, are true professionals, and some of them are just really nice guys. And this guy, he was, he was truly one of the greats, and I would just hope that you sit back and enjoy and listen to the interview and just listen to the man, Kurt Henning. Just listen to how he expresses himself. Listen to him laugh, to how he jokes, and, and, and that he's smiling as he's doing this interview. And listen to the comments specifically that he makes about Brock Lesnar. At this time, Kurt Henning was training Brock Lesnar in Minnesota. He had just signed on to the WWE at the time, so he had not wrestled in any kind of a professional ring. And Kurt just saw the talent in this kid before anybody else did. So without further ado... We're going to take it back to November 22nd, 2000, Pro Wrestling Radio, as we listen to the words, wisdom, and personality of the late, great Mr. Perfect, Kurt Henning. 
Gargiulo with Kurt Henning. And, Kurt, the big question to a lot of fans out there listening to the show now is, what are you doing with yourself these days? Well, I always keep myself in shape. I mean, that's like kind of like a family tradition in the Hennigan family to stay in shape. And uh, I'm just still enjoying myself. I play a lot of golf and been doing a lot of hunting and fishing with my buddies that I've missed out on for the last uh, 15 years or so. But right. so I'm having a good time. Good deal. Good deal. You got a pay-per-view match. I know you already taped with uh, Dennis Rodman. It airs December the 1st. How did that right. whole deal go in Australia? I think it's, it's going to be one of the most exciting pay-per-views that, uh, you know, I know the WWF and the WCW, they got their things out there, but the deal with Dennis Rodman here coming from the basketball scene, I don't think people realize what a great athlete this guy really is. I right. mean, he played with the Bulls all these years and leading rebounder, but uh, uh, he's got his hands full uh, and down under in Australia, and it's, 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 I can't wait to see this thing, in the, and I know the people are all waiting for it. To, the calls I'm getting is unbelievable. Sure, sure. What was his work ethic like going into the match? Uh, I, I didn't have any problem with anything that he does. I mean, that he's um, he's a basketball player, right. but I, I don't know if he wants to uh, earn his living in wrestling or what he's trying to do or if it's part of his uh, bad boy image. But if that's all bad boy he can be, is if that basketball's bad boy, they better call me. That's all i got to say. <laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll be shooting a, a double-triple. Hey, but I'm not taking anything away from this guy. I'm telling you what. He's a tall, lanky, he's a great athlete, and uh, that's pretty much what a lot of the wrestlers are, you know, and uh, he got He's a street fighter, you know. Sure, sure. Now, since since you're not actively um, in the scene as far as with WWF or WCW, do you still that keep... That anybody knows of. Right. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you still keep up with the Monday night shows? Uh, once in a while, yeah. Yeah. I've been, I just got home 10 days hunting up on the Canadian border, and I've got two celebrity hunts coming up. Uh, I was down at the ass car in Atlanta this past week. I got down in the pits there with my buddy, the big boss man. So okay. I've been covering a lot of ground and doing things that I've, uh, I haven't done it for a long time, you know. Uh, okay. Okay. What happened uh, when you originally left the WF to go to WCW? Uh, no, nothing. I just, uh, they wanted me to go back into the wrestling scene, and um, Vince wanted me to wrestle for him, and... Uh, he made an offer for me, and uh, the WCW beat that to death. But, you know, maybe I made a mistake, maybe I didn't. But at that time, I did the right thing. Right. I'm not going to second-guess myself. Right. Is is the bridge burnt there with Vince? Or? No, not at all. Okay. I don't know. That'll never be burnt. Uh, I have a more most respect for Vince McMahon and his whole family. Right, right. That was, uh, that was I left there with a handshake, yeah. Right. Well, my other question to you, I guess what you just answered, is you've, if you regretted making the move at that time. No, not at the time. No, and right now, maybe if I look at the big picture, maybe I, boy, where would I have been? Maybe in a wheelchair or maybe right. I'm coming back. It's it's a it's a two-headed coin, you know, so I'm just... I'm... I've always lived my life like that anyways. I free bird everywhere, you know, so. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Gun for hire. Yeah. Um, at the time, uh, when you were in, in the uh, WWF, you had done a deal where, where you started working on an angle with Steve Austin. And the, yeah. the, the rumor, anyway, was that you were going to wind up wrestling him at Survivor Series if Brett didn't return. Is there any truth to that? Yeah, well, there's a little truth to it. And I don't know much to dwell on that, but... Uh, um, yeah, I think it's uh, it's in there. I mean, the reaction from when I was on uh, the table with Vince, when Austin was in the ring, we had words back and forth, and I know the uh, it was uh, the eruption was unbelievable. So I could just see Vince, uh, you know, <laughs> getting his fingers into something here because you know uh, the character Mister Perfect and the Austin character uh, that would have been a clash, and it still might be. Who knows? Right, right. You guys, it, it seemed anyway when you did the deal where you, where you guys confronted each other at the announce yeah. table, you had a, a lot of heat and had a real good chemistry going. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Austin is, uh, man, I'll tell you what, he, that guy came in there, and he was bound and determined, and, and, uh, and he's a man of his word, and he did, you know, he got an opportunity, he took it, you know, I got to take my hat off to him. Right, right, another guy you worked with uh, right, right in your final days in the WF was, was uh, Triple H. Are oh, you, yeah. Are you surprised? He's doing that, great, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's doing great, I'm happy for him. Yeah, are you surprised at, at uh, successful he became? No, but, and I'm not surprised at all, because he he's a student of the game, you know, and uh, I mean, uh, I guess it's an honor to me that he used to take my tapes and watch them, you know, and, and study them. I mean, not just watch them, but study them. And, and uh, that was the first time anybody had ever come to me in the business and said, hey, I'm watching Mr. Perfect tapes, you know. Hey, wow, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and that me a little bit. So, but uh, now I find out a couple years later that all the Scott Halls and all the Diamond Dallas Pages and all these guys, Shawn Michaels, are all 
product, uh, there's a little bit of ingredients of Kurt Hennig in all of them, and, and that makes me feel pretty good that I've, I've left that much of a mark on an impression on their brains. It definitely, definitely. It seemed at the time when, when, when you hit really big in the WWF uh, with the Mr. Perfect character, yeah. it, it was in it was in a, a land of big giants and, and, and big muscle men, but you put an emphasis back on the athleticism in the game. Yeah, and I think I can still do that. I think it's going around again like that. I think that, uh, you know... Um, uh, the guys that were all bulked up and had all the muscle mass, you know, I was taught a long time ago in this business, learn the business first, then you work out. You know, I mean, you work out during it, but it takes a while to learn this business, you right. know. And these guys that jump in right from the gym all with their bodies all maxed out already, they only got one direction to go, and that's down with the body. Sure. You know, I've... I feel as good as I've ever felt right now. I'm going to the University of Minnesota with this Brock Lesnar, who uh, Vince McMahon has signed. He works in Louisville in developmental. Right. I'm going to work out with him right now. And this guy's out. He, he's, he might be the next bull of the woods, this kid. Yeah, how do you think he's going to do? I was going to ask you about him. I think he's going to do great. I mean, we, we train him here at Brad Ryan in school uh, in Hamill, Minnesota. And uh, he's got a great attitude. Uh, he's a stud, and he learns fast. And... Uh, he's had popularity here being in Minnesota. I mean, he's a first national champion in 50 years, a heavyweight, you know, and uh, so it's a big deal here in Minnesota. And um, he's, he's got recognition around here, but he has the right frame of mind and the mindset to, to be a major star and a force in the WWF, no doubt. Right, absolutely, absolutely. Jumping uh, ahead to your WCW days, what do you attribute the, the rise and the fall of the NWO to, the whole the gimmick, the character? Um, just people not having enough experience how to control characters in the business. Right. I mean, uh, I think maybe they were just thinking that us guys just go out and wrestle and uh, and and become, all of a sudden we're a star or something. But that takes time and, and preparation and, and developing that character, and I don't think they took the time to do that. Goldberg, uh, though, is uh, has developed from that company. Right. But maybe he's the only one, you right. know. I mean, uh, other guys all came in off of Vince McMahon's ride there, you know. Right. I mean, he's the one that developed the Macho Man, the Hogan's, I mean, and, and everything. And they came in, they rolled those coattails, but sooner or later, they didn't know what to do with them. So, um, which I see that company turning around here pretty quick, too. Do you really? You may, you know. Well, they're talking about, well, they were talking about selling uh, a couple of weeks ago up until up until the last week or so. It seems that yeah, deal squashed. I haven't been, I've been up hunting and everything. I, I've been trying not to follow him because I, I, I got enough headache. You know what I mean? <laughs> I've been hitting the head too many times already. Yeah, I guess 15 years, you need a break. Yeah. Yeah. I've had a break. For the last three years, I've had a break. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to go. Yeah, I, I bet. I bet. Now, <laughs> when I'm going to wrestle the amateur wrestlers at the University of Minnesota. I'm wanting to go. Right. Right. I, I can imagine. Now, um, your last, uh, the last year or so in WCW, it, it, it must have been uh, pretty wild because you had Vince Russo coming in, then you had Eric Bischoff back, then you had Vince Russo again. Compa yeah. Compare the two of them, Vince Russo and Eric Bischoff. Well, I just turned the channel in my brain. <laughs> I, 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 one guy gave me a deal, and the other guy knows what I can do. So, right. You know, <laughs> um, I don't know where to go with that. It's, it's a tug of war, you know. So I just, uh, I flipped the channel in my brain. I just. Went and see my buddies and hung out and went hunting, fish and did what I like to do, golf and you know. Right, right. It'll all settle, you know. And if there's if there's room after that, which I know there is, we'll see what happens. Yeah. How did um two guys that, that you worked a lot with, especially uh, one of them, um Scott Hall and Kevin Nash, how did mm -hmm. they how did they change uh, from from their WWF days when you went to work with them in WCW? Well, you know, Scott Hall was with me in uh, sure. he's eighty seven, I think six seven somewhere in there. So he. Uh, he got uh, the Hennigism in him, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I don't know what happened there. I don't know. Uh, I, I stayed in contact with him, but not like I used to. So I don't know what what really happened there. They had it. They had it going, and uh, and I don't know who the Booker was. I, you could ask me who my boss was. I couldn't have told you. <laughs> You're not the first person that told me that. But like in my whole life, I've always I've never worked really independently. I've right. always worked for Vern Gagne or Don Owens out in Portland. I worked, but uh, uh, and then. Finally, I went to WCW, you know, but otherwise I worked for Vince's dad and Vince and Vern. Right. And uh, I've never had to do this, uh, in, uh, what is it called, independent stuff, you know. Sure. And I don't really care to that much. Right. But now this pay-per-view on December 1st, this this was something that I, I chose to do because um, I thought I'd represent wrestling uh, against basketball there a little bit, you know. Absolutely. And, uh, and uh and we'll see how athletic Rodman is. And, I mean, it's a talk around here. Everywhere I go, people are asking me about it. It was on the CNN News here or something. Was, so they're talking about it. And Monday, uh, or I don't know if December 1st or Monday, but December 1st today is going on air. Right, the right. Interview. So and, uh, it's got a great undercard underneath it, too, with the Road Warriors and everything on there. So it's going to be a good good, good pay-per-view. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now, uh, did you vote for Jesse Ventura for governor in your state? 
you kidding me? I'm the one that told him to do it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, can you believe how successful he's become as a media star? And yeah, well, you know what? I believe it, but it's hard to believe you're right. It, it, it's, he, he's doing the most with what he's got, and that's when you got to do things. When you when you got the exposure, you got to use it. And if you don't, well, then you're just a dumb wrestler. Right, you know? right. And uh, and he's using his exposure and more power to him. Now he's announcing for the XFL. I, I see a deal. So Yeah. Um, and the people here in the state of Minnesota, some are for it, some are against it, but those that are against it are wishing they could be governor. So right, it's, right. it's the same old fight, wrestling politics. I guess they go together. Yeah. More than I thought. Especially where you just came from. Right. <laughs> but uh, I, I had Tom Zank on the program a couple weeks ago. He said he Who's didn't. That? I had uh, Tom Zank on the program a couple oh, weeks yeah? ago. Yeah, and he said he didn't vote for Jesse. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. Uh, you know what? What happened to Tom Zank? Jeez, I graduated from high school with Tom Zank. Uh, Tom, Tom, I haven't seen him in three or four years. Oh, wow. Let me tell you something. Tom just recently hit the, the radio shows and the internet shows and Tom's gotten more publicity for what he said in the last month uh, than he ever had in his career. <laughs> well, he's always had that. He's got, he got some big ones, that kid. Uh, oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Good guy, though. Yeah, he's a good, he's a Robinsville boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Graduated the same year as me. I used to help guys, used to beat up on him. I used to have to slap the guys off him. He was 135 pounds. I couldn't believe it, it was the same guy, Tom Zink. Yeah. And then, I went away and started in wrestling. All of a sudden, he was man, he changed. Yeah, Mr. Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to steal my gimmick. <laughs> going back uh, to your <laughs> going back to your AWA days, um, you know, a guy that fascinates me, a lot, a lot of guys tell stories about him, Vern Gagne. What, what was it like working for Vern? Uh, he was pretty strict, you know, pretty yeah. much by the book of, if it, well, I guess that doesn't make any sense to the new fans of today, but uh, sure. <laughs> uh, he was a backbone fixture of this business, you know, but uh, he was the quote-unquote uh, promoter back then, you know, right. and, uh, and I've heard him called a lot of names and a lot of them weren't nice. But, yeah. Um, I, I can't uh, complain about anything because he broke me into business, you know right. what I mean, and, uh, and uh, he gave me opportunity and, and, and I, I did good here, so I don't... Um, he was very strict, though, and uh, and abiding by the rules of this business at that time and everything. And uh, uh, he was never a match for my dad, and that always bothered him, too. Right. And they went to the same high school also. Oh, geez. It's like a whole little clique over there, the Minnesota clique. Well, you know, there used to be the West Texas boys, and it was the Florida boys, and the Minnesota boys. Right. <laughs> some people try to do away with the Minnesota boys, but we're, we're still alive and kicking. You always come back to you always come back in the long run. Sure. And uh, as in WCW, it seemed that uh, that your career was rejuvenated anyway because the, the whole gimmick with the rap is crap thing completely took off. <laughs> Do you think it was great? I, I thought it was great. I loved it. You know, you know I, I, I really was not a fan and haven't been of WCW for a long time, but I used to watch it every week because you guys were entertaining as hell. Well, you know what? They didn't realize I could sing that good. <laughs> <laughs> why, why did it? You know, you know the big question because at the time uh, everybody was asking is why it got squashed so well, quick. All I can tell you is this: that someone with blonde hair came up to me and said, "I can't follow that." Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the last I've seen of it. So I don't know. And, and we had a good group of guys. God bless Bobby Duncan. Right. And while we're on that subject, Rick Root also, you know, and. Uh, because Rude and I went to Robinson with Zinc together. We all graduated, and Brady Boone the same year. Oh, wow. So that was all four of us in, that, in one class. And, and then uh, Brady Boone, you know, of refereed and uh, sure. a little bit. And then uh, Rude, they both died in the same year. Yeah, yeah. And Bobby Duncan. So, but that West Texas Redneck thing, Kerrig and the West Texas Rednecks. And, uh, you know, I just went out and did an interview to dog out the rap a little bit. It's right. not that I hate rap music. It's just that I thought someone ought to go against it. And I said, rap is crap, and it caught on. And I'm telling you, it was a hot deal. It, it was It was very It was very hot, and that's why it... And it was fun to do, you know? Yeah. It, it could, that's why it completely boggled everybody's mind when, all right, the next week on television, it's gone. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I'd never seen it. The signs came out of the woodwork, everybody, and, and they were singing a song, and every one of the boys in the locker room, you go by them, even the Mexicans, hey! <laughs> and they, were, they had it, you know, it was, so... There was a reason for that. Maybe that's what I had to do. Come back, put the real band back together. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Th there you go. Um, in, in your 15-year career, what are some of your more memorable matches that stick out to you? I'll have to definitely say Bret Hart. Right. I mean, uh, you know, um, I have some great matches with Scott Hall, Bret Hart. Bret Hart's probably the standout. Of course, Hogan, you can't leave him off the thing, or Flair. Right. And uh, um, uh, one guy I never got to wrestle with Macho Man, but I'll tell you, out of all the matches, I'd have to say uh, my best match would probably be with Bret Hart. I'd take pretty much same chemistry, same age almost, and uh, same background, and the same... Uh, 
thinking way in the business, you know? Right, right. Even even five, six years later, people still talk about those matches. Yeah, man. And, and uh, I went into that match when I lost that uh, Intercontinental belt to him. I was already done for two months. My back was so bad I couldn't even uh, hardly drink my third beer. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, but I went out and did it. And um, so I, I have a good thing with Bret Hart forever. Yeah. Thank you. In fact, somebody told me uh, he bit my name and a uh, little quote for me on his book. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Brett, Brett thinks very highly of you from from what I could see. You want to charge me to get one of them? I don't get it. <laughs> it's it's a way of the business. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, uh, speaking speaking did of. Did you read Diamond Dallas Page's book? Uh, yes, I did actually. Oh, you're the only one that did. That. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, oh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, oh, d- d- uh, I can't help to be me sometimes. Oh, know? oh, when I had when I had uh, Tom Zank on the show, he went on a, a 15 minute dissertation about that. Dallas Page's his book, so... <laughs> but, but Page was always nice to everybody before he got in a break. I don't understand that. Maybe they're just jealous. I don't know. Uh, right. right. <laughs> well, you, you know, he wasn't... Let's just say, you know, Tom wasn't very fond of his book. <laughs> oh, I didn't read it anyway. But I got an autograph because he, he autographed a pic, uh, book for me. Oh, okay. I got it here in my car right now. Oh, wow. I, I would recommend the Dynamite Kids book, though, if you, if you ever... I heard the Dynamite Kid mention my name in his book also. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Very very highly, which is very rare because everybody everybody else that he mentioned in there, he didn't think too highly of, so... Is that right? Yeah. yeah was, well, I don't know where to get those books from. I don't know. You know I haven't talked to Dynamite in so many years, and, I mean, uh, you know, he was the first guy that I ever really had the wars with. You know, he used to beat the hell out of everybody. Right. And he was a physically fit, like a Chris Benoit style, you know? Right. Well, I should say Chris Benoit is, I mean, uh, is a style of uh, dynamite, you know? Absolutely. This guy was way ahead of his time, and, uh, man, I had no other than anything else to do but to fight back for my life, you right. know? I guess he respected that. Yeah, yeah, he he, he sure did. Um, touching on, on uh, the Hogan matches that you, that you talked about earlier in the WWF, um, another thing that, that always um, interested me is why you guys never had a major program together, because I saw some tapes of the matches that you two had, um, the one yeah. in Madison Square Garden, and, and you guys, again, had a real chemistry with each other. Yeah, well, we had a program. It lasted about six months or so, seven months at longest. Right. But, I mean, it wasn't like it could have been, is what you're saying, I guess. Right, right. I know. Uh, um, I don't know. You know, I just... Um at, during that time, you're you're working so hard, and you're hitting the weight room, and you're doing everything that you, you don't realize really what's going on around you. Sometimes it's it's a it's a road thing. Sure, sure, sure. I can imagine. Um, and another question I have for you: I just had uh, Terry Funk on the program a couple weeks oh, ago. Yeah. yeah. How's old Terry doing? Oh, uh, he's doing great. You know, he he's he's you know in, in WCW sitting home collecting his paycheck. <laughs> he's the toughest son of a bitch I ever met, besides my dad. Oh yeah. Yeah, he, I tell you. yeah. He's 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 one of the good guys in the business. Um, definitely. Glad for that guy, I tell you. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we talked about is uh, about the business itself overall, about it being on an upswing or a downswing, and he thinks it's on a downswing. What do you think? <laughs> well, well, compared to what, 10 years ago, it's on a major upswing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, even a two rating, they're making a lot of money. Maybe the guys don't know that. Maybe I shouldn't be telling them all that. <laughs> uh, a two rating, they're still making money, and it's a, and it's a good business. And I think uh, uh, if you're talking from six months ago, it might be on a downswing, but I think the guys themselves, uh, they eat them, you know, they... They, they're like a two-headed uh, dinosaur. They don't head off in this business. Right, right. You know, something happened there along the way, but it's coming back where people don't even care what it is. They just want to watch it still, you know, and uh, I think that's, as long as you got something that's interesting and the characters are right, people, they don't care. They, they want to see two guys go at it and, Sure. I saw a thing on this court TV last night about some kid slammed a little baby because he saw wrestling. What a bunch of BS. Yeah, yeah. Uh, abs- every, in the Western on TV every day of somebody shooting somebody, you know. Oh yeah, you you can look, you can look for a million different scapegoats for that. Vince is a G rating compared to that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. How much longer do you want to go in the business? I'm going to go till the wheels fall off. Oh yeah. You know, I've been taking it so easy for the last couple of years that I'm now I'm in probably better shape than, <laughs> than I was ten years ago. Yeah. Vince would probably get more longevity by letting you go and then signing you back than he would have if he kept you. Really, really, really double smart. Yeah, you know. We all know that, but I mean maybe. Geez, wouldn't that be a something? Yeah. I, I, I can't believe how good I feel. I just, it's, uh, I guess the rest did me good. If I would have stayed there, I'd probably have been wheelchair it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know, uh, sp- speaking of your WWF days, again, while, while I have you here, another guy you had you had a real good series of matches with was Kerry Von Erich back then, the late Kerry yeah, Von Erich. Yeah. What, what are your memories of that series? Uh, you know, what a tremendous athlete. I mean, that whole family, and what a tragedy. I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, um, you can't say a bad word about Kerry Von Eric because he's just a likable guy and he was such a great athlete. And geez, what a gift he had! Uh, I mean, body wise and look wise and everything. And uh, right. they were good matches. You know, he was a little bit crazy, but I guess we all are a little bit. Sure, 
Sure, ab- absolutely. And uh, again, uh, going back to the um, to, to your whole WCW career there, um, when Vince Russo came in, at the time he started doing a ton of interviews where he said, I'm pushing out the older guys, I'm pushing out the veterans. What were yeah. guys like yourself and, and, and your buddies saying to each other at the time when you're listening to this guy who's just coming in telling everybody he's going to push you out? Oh, wait a minute now. Brock just drove up and he threw me off for a second. Oh, say that again. oh okay. Uh, yeah. Basically, when Vince Russo um, came into WCW, he started doing a ton of interviews and a ton of press, and he kept uh-huh. saying about the fact that he's going to push the older guys and push the veterans out. And what are guys like you and, and the, the veterans that, that you're friendly with thinking to yourselves when you're hearing this guy come in and he's saying he's going to push you out? Well, that's great. Tell me I can't and I will. Right. Right. You know, I mean, uh, well, they found out, I think, too, that they need that, that experienced guy in there to tell the other guys. Because all those good-looking, uh, talented kids from a power plant don't have any direction. Right. And uh, perhaps that's what they need in there is a little bit of direction, you know. And uh, maybe that's what they want me to do. Absolutely. So it goes back to the old guys helping them out a little bit. Not that I'm old, but I mean. Right. I mean, uh I'll go in there with anybody. I don't care. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I know, I know you got to get going. I'd like to have you back sometime in the future when you got some more time. All right. Abs- well, I'm glad you called me. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All good. right, December 1st, Dennis Rodman against Kurt Hennig. Yes, good luck to you, Kurt. Thanks a lot. All right, take care. Bye. Bye. There he is, the late, great, former EWA World Heavyweight Champion, former WCW United States Champion, former WWF Intercontinental Champion, former EWA Tag Team Champion, former a lot of things, a guy that carved... One incredible legacy in this business, Mr. Perfect, truly perfect, Kurt Henning. And for the remaining time that I have here on this program, I'm going to take a break momentarily. But when I come back, the phone lines are open. Now, they're open for your call.com. All righty. Now, uh, with the remaining time of the program, let's bring up some phone calls. James, you're on the air. Hello, Eric. Hey, James. How are you today? I'm fine. How are you? Excellent. Excellent. A little, little sad. A little down in the dumps, you know. Yeah. This is this is sad news. It is, and you know, it makes it it, it makes it even even more upsetting when, when you have that kind of a connection, and you listen to the interview, and you just listen to to to, to what a good guy that he really is. Well, that's sort of why I'm calling. Um uh, just an early Henning memory. Okay. Back, I'm saying this must have been around, I'm not sure the year, but around 79 when he was first in the WWWF. Yes. Uh, and, he, and he tag teamed at the time with Eddie Gilbert a lot. Exa- well, that's where I'm going. Okay. Um, we, uh, I took my kids down to the Spectrum. They were really young. And, of course, we were hanging around afterwards looking for autographs. And sure. Hennig, Hennig and um, Gilbert came out. And Gilbert, he was a little standoffish, but Henning was smiling and talking to the kids, you know, signing autographs. And he remained my youngest son's favorite wrestler up till well, the other day. Yeah. Well, still, I guess, but... Uh, uh, yeah, definitely. That's, a, that's an excellent memory, and that's, uh, that's the kind of guy he was. And um, it, it truly takes, I mean, it truly takes a lot of talent to be wrestling regularly on, on a name basis for over 20 years in this business, which is what he uh, what he what he did for the most part, which is uh, pretty phenomenal when you think about it. Right, and, and, and when you think about the kind of shape that he was in, even at his passing. Right, you know. Yeah. And the other thing, real quick, was uh, I agree totally with what you said about when there was a bunch of big thugs in the WWF, and he came in and wrestled. It was awesome, you know, and because I, you know, for uh, for me anyway. And you can tell me what, what you think. You, you have some years on me here, but for me, I was starting to grow out of that whole Hulkamania thing, and I was looking for something a little different. And here was this guy who was flying all over this place, drop kicking the perfect plex. It was very innovative at that time, and really shaped a lot of today's wrestlers. Which you heard him refer to when he said guys like Triple H were, were watching tapes on Kurt Henning. Right. Exactly. And do you remember uh, the match with between him and Flair when uh, Flair left? Absolutely. Yeah, I was just watching on tape maybe a month ago. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I talked earlier in the program about some some of the the great matches that he had, and that match with Flair was just awesome. The it heat was. behind it, the fans were really into it. Was that was that Raw or was that? Before Raw. That was Raw. Yeah, I thought it was an early Raw, right? It was a very early Raw. It was at the at the Manhattan Center. Right. Okay, Eric, that's all I had to say. Hey, James, I thank you. remember him. Thank you very much for the contribution. I right. appreciate it. Have all a right. great one. Bye. Take care. All right, let's bring up Steve next. Steve has been waiting patiently. Steve, speak clearly because you are on the air. How's it going, Eric? Great. How are you, Steve? All right. Uh, it's tough when those Minnesota boys go. It is. It is. Those... You know, you're looking at a guy, Arn Anderson, Ollie Anderson, Kurt Henning, Rick Flair, uh, Jesse the Body Ventura. Rick Rude. Rick Rude. You know, if you take the Minnesota equation out of pro wrestling, 
I don't think there is pro wrestling. Absolutely. The Road Warriors came from Minnesota. Nikita Koloff comes from Minnesota. Tom Zank came from Minnesota. Uh, you know, Billy Robinson, I believe, trained out in Minnesota. Wasn't, but I, that a, wasn't it, if you remember before uh, the, the horseman blew up or whatever, the, the last incarnation in the WCW, I think it was either Arn or Oli, the, they gave him the hand. That was Arn. That was Arn and said, it's your turn to take over. Absolutely. So, that, uh, I mean, it doesn't get, it doesn't get any better than that. Not at all. I mean, that's the kind of respect that, that, that Kurt Hennig commanded. And even in his 40s, when he returned to the WWE after being out for what was passing was more tragic than the other. But with those guys, their careers were, were, were pretty much behind them at that point. And they were in, in semi-retirement training for comebacks. Kurt Hennig, as, as, as old as he was. Pharmacist and the other one was the pusher. Well, uh, you, you, you know what I'm talking about. Hey, you sure. said it. You said it, not me. And and this uh, this program has always been an open forum. So uh, so so please. Let them sue me. I don't care. But I'm t- everybody knew that. The I, reason most people stayed with the WWF over the others was if you need if you were hurt, Vince would give you something to make you feel better. Well, and, you know, and, and I think it's Vince is going to get paid back in the next six months for that. His whole company is on a man who's, whose knee is worse than Kevin Nash's. He's putting everything on Stone Cold. And from what I've been reading and what I've been seeing on the Internet, he has two good matches left. And I don't think he'll make it to WrestleMania. Well, um, you know, as far as uh, what you said with, with, with Vince and the Pills, I mean, that's that's all everybody's speculation. There's been stuff documented. And, hey, you know, the proof... The proof is in the pudding, uh, so to so It's to the speak. ultimate war of what Vince McMahon did for him. You know, I mean, it just it boggles my mind that, that a guy in such incredible shape like Kurt Henning can just right. drop dead like that. It just it just does. Uh, you know, even even Ted Petty, uh, who, who passed uh, not too long ago, was in tremendous shape in his 50s, and, and they're dropping like that. I think what's going to be very interesting in the next 10 years or so, and not just in wrestling, uh, the big steroid boom of the 80s, 90s and even now there are a lot of athletes uh you know a- out of pro wrestling that are i mean hey we all uh read read the article in sports illustrated um uh, about six seven months ago where where some baseball players came out and said that that 80 percent i believe was the quote of baseball players are, are on steroids what's well, going to be very interesting in 10 years the toll that that the the use of that drug takes on 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 these athletes that I, I can't talk today these athletes bodies well you said you were angry about raw i'm more angry that Vince still hasn't delivered yet. Well, uh, you know Bill what? Gold, you know, Bill Goldberg is not coming to WWF. Well, uh, tonight on Confidential, they have claimed that they will address the Bill Goldberg situation. We well, you know why. They already have the guy in tow. He's from Australia, and he works for the half price. Nathan Jones. You know, and, and, uh, and the kicker is, Vince got to think of himself, and, he, and, you, and you let it slip. There are too many people in the locker room at Raw who would make Bill Goldberg's life a living hell. And there are a couple of them. There's one in particular in SmackDown. They'll do everything they, they can to stab him in the back. He won't last for six months. Well, I'll tell you something. Um, the WWE has, um, they, they have come up extremely, extremely small two times on two different occasions, I believe, this year so far. Number one with that Raw 10th anniversary show, and number two with the Raw this past Monday. They were promoting both of these events as to be something that they weren't. What you saw was just an average show at the Raw 10th. What you saw was an average show Monday. We were told that this was going to be where Eric Bischoff was going to let it all fly, that, that we were going to see surprises, that Bischoff was going to pull well, you know, a uh, rabbit out of the hat. I mean, you know, if I'm Eric Bishop, you know, and if, if this is my last show and this is my last to raw no way out, I'll go right after Stone Cold's well, left knee. I don't care if, I, if I'm if i the man that takes him out. Well, I'll tell you something, Steve. Uh, what a lot of people don't know that don't read the Internet is that Steve Austin was at Raw this past Monday and came out to the ring after Raw went on the air and gave Eric Bischoff a stunner. Why he was kept off of the air, uh, you know, I, you can make arguments either way on it, but at a time right now when they're desperate for ratings... You really you really think Sean McMahon's going to be able to keep Stone Cold in, in line? We'll have to see. You know, I, don't th- I don't think... Th- there's very few people in that locker room that can talk to Stone Cold. In fact, the only one that really he even listens to makes his living in Hollywood. So, I mean, there's nobody there that he respects. Well, uh, you know, again, very strong opinions today, uh, Steve, and, and, uh, and I want to thank uh, you. Have a good one, Eric. Hey, I want to thank you for checking in the show. Uh, you know, great input. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care. All right, let's bring up Jeff, who has uh, been waiting for a little while here. Jeff, you are on the air. Hi. How you doing, Eric? It's been a while since I talked to you. Yes, it has been, but I'm glad to have you back. Yeah, uh, I, I'll tell you, this, this uh, Kurt Henning thing, I was really shocked because... 
when he came back to the WWE, I'm talking months and months ago. Yes. He, it, I thought his career was going to go right back up. Absolutely. Because, because I, you know, Vince McMahon could have done a lot. And I, I can't understand for the life of me why they, you know, because of something so small and stupid. I mean, I've read in the papers what, what supposedly happened. Right. Who knows what really happened. But... Why would Vince McMahon do something like that to him? You know, it's just uh, unbelievable. Well, from what I understand, um, you know, Kurt's, uh, Kurt's release from the WWE was mutual. That, um, you know, Kurt, Kurt was losing a lot, and Kurt was not being promoted to the best of his abilities. I mean, we all saw, like you said, at the Royal Rumble, he came in with a bang and was put right into a program with Stone Cold Steve Austin. Then the next week, he's getting pinned by Goldust on, on Monday Night Raw. And I think Kurt saw the writing on the wall... And it was an opportunity for both he and Vince to leave with another handshake and to leave the door open. And it would not have surprised me to see Kurt Henning return at some point in the future because obviously by watching NWA TNA, by, by seeing what he did with MECW uh, a year and a half, two years ago here in Philadelphia, the guy still has some drawing power in this business. And he was in tremendous shape for a guy that has wrestled in this business 20-something years. Uh, to be in that kind of shape is just truly phenomenal, especially the kind of style that, that he wrestled. Um, so, you know, as far as what went down with, with him and Vince, I'm sure both of them would have liked to, uh, for uh, things to turn out different. But like you said also, and you, and you said this as well, who knows what really happened? Yeah, it, it's, it's something that, you know, it's going to keep our minds boggling. But, you know, a, you know, God bless Kurt Henning, you know. I mean, he, he was a fantastic wrestler. He's, he was one of the finest there was. And, you know, a true I, innovator. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean,. I, I I'll go back. I like to go back uh, back to the days when he was him and Scott Hall were the tag team champions in the AWA, and they were feuding with the Irwins. Yeah. Oh, and that was like one of the best feuds I think I ever wrestling ever. And it just when the AWA just left. You know, I mean, I I, I couldn't understand where Kurt Henning would go from there, but. I'll go one better for you. How about that 60-minute draw with Nick Bockwinkle on that Thursday night on the that ESPN for was, Las Vegas? That was fantastic. Phenomenal. I remember that like yesterday. The bloodbath. Remember the blood and the figure four leg lock as they were as the clock was winding down. That that was fantastic. I, I'll I'll never forget that. I was I was with my uh, my buddies. We were watching that match, and I was just excited just watching them because. You know, because I, I was just getting into, into watching him at that time, just learning all about him, and his, his ring style was just unbelievable. Absolutely. You know, there are, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of legends in this business, and there are a lot of what I'll call quiet legends, and he's definitely a quiet legend because right now, when, when you and I sit on here and converse and retrospect about the memories and the innovations that he brought to this business, he truly was a legend. Oh, yeah, he was fantastic, and... Like, you know, it's it just too bad he could, couldn't go further when he did, you know. I mean, it's just a shame that he had passed away. It's a, it's a, it's a big loss. It's a loss. It's a big loss to, to the sport. It's a big loss to humanity because if, if you were listening to that interview, I mean, it just, I think that interview expressed what kind of a man he was, how good of a man he was. Oh, he, he was fantastic. That's all there is to it. Like you said in the interview, I'm just being me. That's all I can be. Yeah. You know? I'd like to make a, another comment. Absolutely. Uh, uh, co concerning the... Uh, Monday Night Raw and SmackDown as Please. of late. Uh, I just have been totally, totally disappointed because uh, I've been talking to some friends of mine who 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 uh, also what who's a big wrestling fan, sure. and he just between him and I, I don't think Vince McMahon's got anything left. You know, I, I just I just think I, I I think that Vince is not tapping into what's current that what what the current fan wants, what the current fans are demanding what the current fans need. I think exactly. Vince, Vince has a different kind of mentality, and Vince cannot relate to the fans today. It, it just seems like, like all the older wrestlers are the ones that are just lingering on than the newer guys. I agree. Like, like the, the older guys as far as uh, Shawn Michaels, Hulk Hogan, who I've been, you know, been seeing a lot of as of late, and it just, where, where are these young guys at that they're supposed to be bringing up? They're not grooming them. They're not grooming these young guys properly, and that is the problem right now with the ratings. The ratings are, are a reflection of the fact that fans are tired of seeing the same guys on top, and when you try and elevate a guy like a Rob Van Dam or, or, or a Matt Hardy and put them in the main event, the fans don't buy it because for the last two years they have been conditioned to, to view these guys as mid-carters. 
It's a shame. It is. It's a, sh- it's a, it's a crying shame that Vince McMahon can't even get, get anything together, you know. And, and these, this Stone Cold thing is like, I'm the self on that. Is, what, what, is he going to ever bring him back on a proper, regular basis? I, from what I understand, after No Way Out, he will be back full time. Okay. So, we'll, we'll have to see. You know, I mean, Stone Cold is up there. Stone Cold has, has some nagging injuries. Stone Cold isn't 25 years old anymore. So, how much more does Stone Cold have left uh, is a big question. Yeah, that's true. Hey, uh, wh- what do you think about the, the, the thing about uh, coming back? Interesting point that you bring up there. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Sting did an interview recently where he publicly stated that he is returning to the WWE with a, a, a semi-regular schedule. And I think it's great because I, I think the fans from WCW uh, have a place in their heart for Sting. I think the last big business that WCW did was with Sting and Hulk Hogan. I don't know where you would fit Sting in right now in the current spectrum of the WWE, but I do think that there is absolutely 100% unequivocally a place in that company for Sting. How about you? Well, I, 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 sh- I sure hope they do bring it back because I've been a Sting fan since 1987 when he was in WCCW and he, he stayed with WCW till its final days he sure did I, I, I think I think if they brought him back but but slowly brought him in little by little he they could turn this into a big thing like have a sting like versus stone Cold or something. Well, <laughs> ha, kind of funny you say that in the interview that he did when he talked about returning uh, Stink said that he doesn't have enough hair on his head to do the uh, spiked hair gimmick anymore. So, oh, and we'll, have to, we'll have to see what happens. But uh, listen, Art, thank you very much for your call and your thoughts. Hey, it's been a pleasure talking to you, Eric. I know it's been a while, but uh, I still listen to the show every week. Well, excellent. Listen, make your calls more frequent. All right, certainly will. Take care, Jeff. All right, take care. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. All righty. Again, now we have open lines. A full board of, fo- uh, full board of phone calls has been going through. So uh, if you call in now, we will get you on the air. That is 1-888-922-2149 or 215-949-3232. That's toll free again, 888-922-2149. Again, your thoughts on Kurt Henning, your thoughts on Sting, your thoughts on Raw this past week, but particularly I would love to talk about Kurt Henning or more Kurt Henning. In the meantime, you're listening to the show in two places. One, on the internet through my website, prowrestlingradio.com. WBCB 1490, Abu, Nasawa, The Hit Squad, Low Key, Homicide, just about everybody and anybody that is involved in the Philadelphia wrestling scene will be in Philadelphia tonight at the Electric Factory for 3PW. All right, let's go back to the phones. Marvin has been waiting. Marvin, you're on the air. How you doing? I'm doing okay, Marvin. How are well, you? Well, I spoke, to you good, I spoke a few weeks ago. Got to tell you, it's simple. The only reason the ratings are dropping, and we discussed it the last time, they need another league, they, whether it's another division, another owner, or Vince is a silent partner. You've got too much talent, and I'm not somebody, I, I don't even follow the minor. When I say, I don't follow the locals, whatever you call them, I'm just someone who's going to watch whether it was WCW or WWE, as they now call it. Right. I don't watch the other stuff. And that's what the heart, that's what the mainstream. I understand you're always going to, and there's, I'm not saying wrong or right, but the only problem they have now is, it's just there's no room, there's no excitement because how long can you spin around now? They brought Scott Steiner, another old guy in. You need someone who's got totally different. It's not the W, even if they admit to being a smaller league. You need another mainstream because it's a disgrace that these guys can't get promoted anymore. Well, I think uh, what's, what, what's interesting is that, is that you've said it all, and what, what, what you have done is epitomize the passion for wrestling the pro wrestling fans have and that as disenfranchised as us wrestling fans become we still hang in there with that possibility of having that can't miss monday night raw or or that can't miss smackdown but you know what we haven't had one of those in a long long time there is a possibility and a lot of talk about the resurgence of ecw as a matter of fact with vince mcmahon as the owner but a silent owner run by paul heyman as a, a brand new company, as a brand new entity, how much competition that will bring out from Vince McMahon when he owns the same company, I don't know. But it could possibly give the fans that other alternative what they're looking for. Is that the answer? I honestly don't think so. I think the answer is a separately run company by somebody not involved with the WWE that does bring competition. TNA is not going to do it. The independents, as strong as they are, have, have so much in limited power 
And um, right now, we're just in a, uh, a sit-back-and-wait mode, and it kind of stinks if you're a wrestling fan. It really does. I enjoy it, but again, as I said, I, only get, I don't have enough time to watch much or to run down the local stuff. And I admit, it's almost like I'm the guy nobody... It's like I'm the mainstream fan. And I'm good. Hey, I used to go when Gorilla Monsoon couldn't speak English, and Red Barry was, like, talking for him. I've been at this little off arena, you know. It's, it's just it's frustrating because there's a lot of talent. When you say talent... There's a lot of guys out there. They got that kid Sean O'Hare on, like, I, I see on dark matches. They sure. Say. It's just, there's no reason for it. It's not that Vince has lost touch. Vince knows how to promote a guy. They just don't know how to handle it. He gets afraid that he's not going to be able to promote the next one. Well, listen, listen, Marvin, I appreciate your passion. Unfortunately, I'm up against a hard break have here. Have my friend. Hey, you two have a great weekend. Hope Thank to hear you. from you soon. I mean, he said it all. He said it all for all of us. Let's uh, hit a quick spot here, and we'll be right back. Pro wrestling fans. If you're thinking of having an event such as a carnival, personal appearance, wrestling show, or a fundraiser, call the True Vince of Professional Wrestling, 215-547-4068, or Baker Vince one at AOL.com. The World Wide Wrestling Alliance uses wisdom and personality of the late, great Mr. Perfect, Kurt Henning. Eric Arjula with Kurt Henning. And, Kurt, the big question to a lot of fans out there listening to the show now is, what are you doing with yourself these days? Well, I always keep myself in shape. I mean, that's like kind of like a family tradition in the Henning family to stay in shape. And uh, I'm just still enjoying myself. I play a lot of golf and been doing a lot of hunting and fishing with my buddies that I've missed out on for the last uh, 15 years or so. But right. so I'm having a good time. Good deal. Good deal. You got a pay-per-view match. I know you already taped with uh, Dennis Rodman. It airs December the 1st. How did that right. whole deal go in Australia? I think it's, it's going to be one of the most exciting pay-per-views that, uh, you know, I know the WWF and the WCW, they got their things out there, but the deal with Dennis Rodman here coming from the basketball scene, I don't think people realize what a great athlete this guy really is. I right. mean, he played with the Bulls all these years and leading rebounder, but uh, uh, he's got his hands full uh, and down under in Australia, and, it's, and it's, I can't wait to see this thing, in the, and I know the people are all waiting for it. The calls I'm getting is unbelievable. Sure, sure. What was his work ethic like going into the match? Uh, I, I didn't have any problem with anything that he does. I mean, that he's um, he's a basketball player, right. but I, I don't know if he wants to uh, earn his living in wrestling or what he's trying to do or if it's part of his uh, bad boy image. But if that's all bad boy he can be, is if that basketball's bad boy, they better call me. That's all i got to say. <laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll be shooting a, a double-triple. Hey, but I'm not taking anything away from this guy. I'm telling you what. He's a tall, lanky, he's a great athlete, and uh, that's pretty much what a lot of the wrestlers are, you know. And uh, he got He's a street fighter, you know. For the act, Henning, um, you know, one of the one of the true legends of this sport. And I had Kurt on this program November the 22nd of 2000 to promote an upcoming match that was taped that was to air on pay-per-view from Australia with Dennis Rodman. And in that time, we talked about a variety of different subjects. Remember, this is prior to his return to the WWE in the 2002 Royal Rumble as well as this is past his tenure in world championship wrestling and it's 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 sadly ironic because i was planning on having kurt back on the program in a few weeks i'd stayed in touch with him after the interview and he was just a good man he was just a good guy you know there's a lot of people that i have had the opportunity to meet in this business over the years and some of them are jerks and some of them are, are, are true professionals, and some of them are just really nice guys. And this guy, he was, he was truly one of the greats. And I would just hope that you sit back and enjoy and listen to the interview and just listen to the man, Kurt Henning. Just listen to how he expresses himself. Listen to him laugh, to how he jokes, and, and, and that he's smiling as he's doing this interview. And listen to the comments specifically that he makes about Brock Lesnar. At this time... Kurt Henning was training Brock Lesnar in Minnesota. He had just signed on to the WWE at the time, so he had not wrestled in any kind of a professional ring, and Kurt just saw the talent in this kid before anybody else did. So without further ado, we're going to take it back to November 22nd, 2000, Pro Wrestling Radio, as we listen to the words told in once or a million times a family member of this program. And I thought about it over the last few days as to how I could come on here and eulogize this man because I have always been a big, big fan of his. I mean, going back to his matches in Memphis, going back to that 60-minute that draw that he had with Nick Bockwinkle from Las Vegas on ESPN years ago, the bloodbath. 
going back to the series of matches that he had with Bret Hart, that he had with Shawn Michaels, that he had with Ric Flair. The man just truly epitomized everything that an athlete should be in professional wrestling. And in thinking about it, I went back and screened the interview that I had played with Kurt Henning back in November of the year 2000, November 22nd, the year 2000. And it just expressed so much that the, the kind of a man he is, the kind of passion that he had for this business. When you listen to this interview that I will replay momentarily, you can tell that as he's doing the interview, he has a smile on his face. And while I've had a lot of great guests over the years, from Bret Hart to, to Shane Douglas to Dusty Rhodes to Ricky Steen, but a lot of legends, it's very rare that when you get them on the air, they, they, they do it with, with, with such a smile on their face. And you could tell that he just loved talking about wrestling. He just loved talking about the business. He's a second-generation wrestler. His father, Larry. Toll free at 1-888-922-2149 or locally at 215-949-3232. And that's the bottom line because the loose cannon said so. All right, everybody, good afternoon. My name is Eric Argiulo and this a very special edition of Pro Wrestling Radio. And over the last seven days, Monday specifically, this great sport lost one of our greats a true pioneer and innovator of this business in Mr. Perfect, Kurt Henning. And Kurt Henning is the kind of a guy that completely revolutionized this sport as to the way that you see it presented to you today in a more athletically based form. Kurt Henning came along, especially to the WWE, at a time when stars like Tugboat, Hulk Hogan, The Ultimate Warrior, Earthquake, guys that were big, not very mobile, but more entertaining. And Kurt Henning came along and put the sport back in sports entertainment. And uh, this is the first time, to my knowledge anyway, that I've had a, a member of this family, the, the pro wrestling radio family. I've had a memory, excuse me, a, a family member lost. And I consider him a family member because he was a past guest on the program. I consider everybody that calls into the show, whether you've called. Sure, sure. Now, since since you're not actively um, in the scene as far as with WF or WCW, do you still that keep up? anybody knows of. Right. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you still keep up with the Monday night shows? Ah, uh, once in a while, yeah. Yeah. I've been, I just got home 10 days hunting up on the Canadian border, and I've got two celebrity hunts coming up. Uh, I was down at the NASCAR in Atlanta this past week. I got down in the pits there with my buddy, the big boss man. So okay. I've been covering a lot of ground and doing things that I've, I haven't done it for a long time, you know. Uh, okay. Okay. What happened uh, when you originally left the WF to go to WCW? Uh, no, nothing. I just, uh, they wanted me to go back into the wrestling scene, and um, Vince wanted me to wrestle for him, and... Uh, he made an offer for me, and uh, the WCW beat that to death. But, you know, maybe I made a mistake, maybe I didn't. But at that time, I did the right thing. Right. I'm not going to second-guess myself. Right. Is is the bridge burnt there with Vince? Or? No, not at all. Okay. I don't know. That'll never be burnt. Uh, I have a more most respect for Vince McMahon and his whole family. Right, right. That was, uh, that was I left there with a handshake, yeah. Right. Well, my other question to you, I guess what you just answered, is you, if you regretted making the move at that time. No, not at the time. No, and right now, maybe if I look at the big picture, maybe, I, boy, where would I have been? Maybe in a wheelchair or maybe right. I'm coming back. It's it's a it's a two-headed coin, you know, so I'm just... I'm, I'm, I've always lived my life like that anyways. I'm free bird everywhere, you know, so. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Gun for hire. Yeah. Um, at the time, uh, when you were in, in the uh, WWF, you had done a deal where, where you started working on an angle with Steve Austin. And the, yeah. the, the rumor, anyway, was that you were going to wind up 